Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Elian with Ramin Farjad. I'm going to talk today about the memory wall. Ramin, for years people have talked about the memory wall. What exactly is it? So if you look at the, the progress of the computer chips over the last uh, 20 years, uh, you see that effectively the performance of this computer or processor has gone up by almost five orders of magnitude. But these guys need to do processing on the data that comes from the memory. But the bandwidth from the memory has not even gone up by like 100x. So there's a larger than tons and x delta between the amount of data that these guys, the processor are processing or can process versus the data that is coming in. <clears throat> of course, with um, HPM and chiplet solutions, they have been able to improve the bandwidth significantly. And uh, that is why chiplets is becoming more and more dominant in uh, especially high performance computing and AI. But it's still, there is the gap. I mean, chiplets provide high bandwidth, but there is also uh, capacity issues that are involved. So combination of these two has caused uh, something which you call memory wall, meaning there is not enough data from the memory coming to the processors uh, for the processors to process. At the same time, especially with the AI models, there's something called arithmetic intensity, which means the number of uh, functions or operations that the processor runs on the memory. And uh, the arithmetic intensity of the AI models are much less than what it used to be, especially if you're doing inference versus training. So as a result, there is more and more demand for bandwidth from the memory into uh, the processor. And that's uh, what we're trying to solve at Elian. This gets even worse as we move into some of the advanced nodes too, right? Because in the past, you could basically use a lot of SRAM for this, and the SRAM doesn't scale anymore. So now you have to do a lot more HBM DRAM. That is correct, yes. So SRAM will give you effectively the highest bandwidth, but uh, there is a limitation on the size, and especially with AI and AI models, and these, as they're also growing in every generation of them, people do need a larger and larger capacity. And of course, they may be good enough uh, for some of the inference functions, the smaller inference functions, but even for larger inference, you start to need a lot more memory capacity on top of bandwidth. That's why HPM becoming more and more important as a result. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Ramin, what are we looking at? So here I've drawn a picture of an example GPU. It can be very much uh, like a black ball that has two processors, pretty much vertical size with uh, HPM chiplets, uh, memory chiplets around it. And you of course see that why these have to be vertical size, especially that the edge that uh, you're putting the memories are uh, effectively the, the smaller edge because they wanted the larger edge, which is the 32 millimeter of the reticle for the IO. But in reality, if you look at, the, for example, Black Vault, it has 10,000 teraflops of uh, operations. But when you do the math, the amount of memory bandwidth that they get from HPM, especially these are HPM 3E, is significantly less than what this process, uh, these two GPUs can process. So Why are you using more than one GPU here? So effectively, as I said, these can deliver 10,000 teraflops uh, of, of operation, but the limitation is not that, you know, because of the compute per, uh, purposes, it's because they needed more beachfront to bring in more bandwidth into these uh, two chiplets. If you look at the Blackwell, for example, maybe is 20% uh, utilized effectively for most function, if not less, but uh, that is mainly limited by the memory and memory bandwidth that they can come into this and get out. So that's effectively what we call the memory wall. And pretty much what you're doing here is parsing the computation, right, into multiple different chips or chiplets. And so now what you have to do is say, okay, we have more processing going on, we have more data, and we have to be able to, to store that data somewhere and be able to access it consistently and very quickly. Where do people run into problems with this? So one of the issues, of course, is, especially if you want to do training, all the parameters that you want to have will not fit on the HBMs. So HBM has high bandwidth. It's still not enough high bandwidth to supply the 
the amount of flops that these GPU have, but the capacity is another limitation. And that's why when you want to run training, even some of the uh, inference uh, models, you want a large number of GPUs. So these models will be loaded on all these HPMs from, uh, you know, across all these GPUs. And uh, of course, they need to be able to talk to each other, these GPUs, because this GPU need to access the data from the HPM on another one. And that's why the IO becomes very important. And that's why if we look at it, they are decided to use the longer beachfront, which is the 32 millimeter, for that IO purpose as a result. We've had other proposal, innovative proposal of how to further address this. And one of the solutions that we propose in the, to the industry is now that we have a solution called custom HBM, and this custom HBM gives us the ability to customize the base style of these HBM solutions. So by doing that, we can not only put a much higher banded D2D interface between the HBM base style and the GPU, we can provide it so much higher bandwidth that we can use the excess bandwidth on the other side. And on the other side, we can connect to additional things. These additional things could be another row of HPM. It potentially doubles the amount of HPM that this GPU can have access to. That means you can cut the number of GPUs that you use, which is a significant cost saving as a result. And, or you can use these as IO chiplets to provide higher bandwidth externally or a combination of the two. And when we talk about custom HBM, it's not really that the HBM is being customized. It's what's going on around the HBM that's being customized, right? Pretty much. So HBM is a stack of DRAMs, and the bottom layer of it has historically had basically a D2D5 to connect to the processor. But by introducing a FinFET technology uh, that can provide much higher performance, you can put more functions than just a simple D2D. I mean, in the past, people have been limited by the power density and the thermal density of the base die and what they could do in it because they use a slow DRAM, DRAM process. Now, when you switch to FinFET or high performance, maybe five, four, three nanometer kind of technology, you can do the five technology, like phi or interconnect at a much lower bandwidth power and be able to add other functions in the base stack. Other functions could be memory controller, could be uh, another D2D5 on the other side, and also a data connectivity or a NOC inside that base stack. When engineering teams are working with this, where do they typically run into problems? What do they have to think about that they didn't think about before? Of course, this becomes a custom solution and it usually like it's all the challenges that you have to deal with when designing a chiplet solution that uh, you have to think ahead of time the verification of this piece with the other pieces as chiplets are uh, one of the challenges that people will have so it's just a whole new mindset of uh, being able to build a system as a system of chiplets inside the package and uh, making sure that all these interconnects work together properly, as opposed to using in the past, people used all the connectivity or standard connectivity. You could test these IOs or files ahead of time and make sure that everything, you know, compliant, standard compliant and so forth. These days, because performance basically is the most important factor, people want proprietary interfaces that are not necessarily standardized because the standardization takes a long time of its own, be able to make sure that these high-end uh, interconnects are qualified, are tested, and works perfectly as they expect before they put it inside uh, these uh, systems. How does all this affect things like signal integrity and power integrity? You've got lots of moving pieces here, right? Definitely, you have to design this whole system all together. So it's not just designing each chiplet separately. In the past, you could design a chip and uh, together with the package that it sits in, as long as that module by itself worked well, then you know you just have to worry about it. And you know, doing designing on the board, the board design is something that you can maybe spin it if things do not work as perfectly. But once you put it in, inside this big picture especially when you do advanced packaging and dealing with interposer and so forth, this is not a simple respin of uh, 
the interposer, the package, and so forth. So that's why you know other company, CAD companies are coming up and been proposing and are offering the CAD tools that can provide testing or verifying and simulating this whole solution altogether. And that becomes super important, whether it's signal integrity or power integrity. Another thing that people have to realize when they're designing these is that you have a lot more data going through here, a lot more data to process, and these are not working like a lot of the processors in the past because they're doing a lot more computing than they were in the past too, right? So these things are really running at a much higher utilization rate than a lot of the designs in the, the previously. You've got thermal gradients, you've got uh, noise that's coming through because of all this computing. How does that get in, inputted into the design? This is, of course, um, the engineers have to, that's why the chips of today will take hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to build with teams that are significantly larger. It's not just a matter of uh, coming out the code, RTL, having it synthesized and packaging and so forth. The whole system has to be designed uh, all together with all the, let's say, power density and thermal density. All those things should be accounted for all the way down from the point that you do place and rot of the solution and the design of the solution. So those will all come into a picture. It's just like we are designing a system here. It's not a chip anymore. So in the past, you did a chip. Now, effectively, that's why they call it SIP, system in a package. Is a real system that you're designing the whole system as part of a package. Does that make the uh, decisions about how to solve the memory wall more difficult or easier? So definitely chiplets provide significantly. So we have something, of course, memory wall or IO wall at the same time, something called power wall. So the two will come, you know, they work hand to hand. We cannot put a very high speed, high bandwidth interface here to solve the memory wall without having the power in mind. So chiplets have been a great solution to provide order and order or maybe orders of magnitude higher bandwidth at order of magnitude uh, lower power. So these are, that's basically it's been a saver of uh, maybe both Moore's law and the demand for computing that needs to double every, uh, every one and a half, two years. While the demand for that is much more than double every one and a half to two years. So chiplets has effectively provided that option to give us that significant higher bandwidth at uh, lower power for us. So as a result, uh, everybody needs to make it work. And that's why there's so much focus on industry on solving these challenges, because that's how uh, these wall effectively performance walls can be removed. Not just the 2D or 2.5D, but also 3D and then 3.5D that we see uh, are coming up. Ramin Farjad, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.